Okay, I'm going to get going. Uh, I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships here at the Wharton Eschrick Museum. We're really thrilled that you could join us tonight to celebrate Homa's stage. I'm just going to have some images to share with you before we get to the main event tonight, which is a conversation with our artists. So I'm going to share my screen here. So Home Stage is the third offering in our 50th anniversary year celebration, which includes a series of installations and programs exploring the idea of home. The other offerings in that series, uh, you can take a look on our website and see more information about them. Um, Home Stage, which runs from today <laughs> until December 30th when we close for the 2022 season, um, asks visitors to the museum to really consider Eshrick's home and studio, not only as a kind of set on which the artists' ambitions played out, but also a stage that hosted others, often other artists, whose conversation, collaboration, connections, and um, uh, engagement made Eshrick's life richer and that much prof more for profound. Before we dig into the installations, I just wanna invite you to join us for a few upcoming virtual and in-person programs. Our next Spotlight Talk, which is on the artist and textile designer, June Groff on September 27th at noon. Um, we're gonna be talking about Eshrick and Groff's friendship through letters, artworks, exchanged between them and a look at Groff's painting and textile works in the studio. On October 9th, we have our official 50th anniversary celebration, a song well sung celebrating 50 years at the Wharton Eshrick Museum. That's gonna be a really fun, big party on site, um, including a number of the artists who you're gonna hear speaking tonight. So if you enjoy them, please come and join us for that. I also wanna share with folks that our call for entries for the museum's 29th annual juried woodworking show is now open. The theme is telling tales. So we're looking at storytelling and narrative. Um, you can find out more information about artist opportunities, upcoming virtual talks, recordings of past programs, and more on our website. So I'm really looking forward to jumping into the exhibition with you tonight to celebrating these four artists. I'll speak for about 10 to 15 minutes to do this introduction to the show and to our featured artists. Um, we're really lucky to have them with us tonight. And after the introductions, we'll have a roundtable conversation about their experience working with the Eshrick studio space and building conversations between their contemporary practice and Eshrick's legacy. Uh, we'll have about 10 minutes at the end to ask questions, so save them up. At that point in the evening, I'll ask folks to unmute themselves. So please mute yourself if you are not already muted. Um, and jump in if there's uh, an opening then. And you will also answer any questions that appear in the chat at the end of the program. Please put them in the chat throughout. My colleagues will answer them if they're able to or we'll save them up for the artists at the end. So. To take it back to sort of where Home is Stage started, last year we invited four uh, Philadelphia and, and one Philadelphia and Vermont uh, based contemporary artists, Emily Karras Duncan, Kat, uh, Kay Healy, Colin Pizzano, and Stacey Lee Weber, to use the Estrick space as a stage for their own creative practice. All of these artists spent time in the studio and in its archives, developing connections with aspects of Estrick's life, the players and his story the physical nature of the space. Depending on that experience and their learning and research, each artist chose to either select existing work or create new objects to display in Eshrick's home. And this happened in a couple of different ways. We were on site, we were in artist studios. I'm showing a visit um, with Colin Pizzano in his, his studio on the left, or we were sending photographs back and forth and zooming uh, as I was with Emily from Vermont. So uh, it, we really were able to engage um, the studio in lots of different capacities. To introduce you to the artists, uh, I first wanna introduce you to Emily Karras Duncan. She's an, uh, they're an artist and educator whose work explores the materiality of trauma using textile techniques. 
the co-founder of the Art Department Collective and High Pastors, a new nonprofit interdisciplinary studio and retreat space dedicated to supporting the work of marginalized creative practitioners in Vermont. For this exhibition, Emily was inspired by the links they found between Eshrick's work and textile design. Her, uh, her, their beautiful piece is now on view in the studio's bedroom. Uh, Emily writes that they wanted their quilt to, and I'm gonna quote them here, embody Eshrick's work and relationships. I cross-referenced the wood in his work with what was dyeable and used woods from the Eshrick campus to dye the quilts on view in the studio. Having the opportunity to visit the studio and learn about Eshrick, Letty and their community taught me about the beauty of surrendering to the artist's life. If you want a beautiful life, you have to craft it. And I'm showing here um, image of the Bach fireplace, which was an inspiration for Emily, as well as some drawings that we exchanged. And then Emily at work uh, doing the dyeing that that made the sort of amazing colors in 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 their final piece, uh, which did include woods from uh, the Eshrick the Eshrick campus as uh, raw materials. Through her life-size drawn, painted, and screen printed fabric installations, Kay Healy investigates themes of loss, home, displacement, and resilience with interview-based projects. At WEM, we're showing a selection of objects from Healy's larger bodies of work, including two newly made toothbrushes, which you can see in this little image uh, uh, on, the, on the right uh, in the bathroom at the studio that speak to Miriam Phillips' life in the studio alongside Wharton Eshrick. Um, Healy wanted to have a soft touch approach to installing the work so that it is embedded seamlessly within the space and will surprise and delight viewers. And I think you can see how well integrated that is in the middle image here where some of uh, her really wonderful uh, kind of trompe l'oeil frying pans are hanging above, uh, amongst the, the pans, uh, Eshrix pans that are coming from the ceiling. Several of the objects on view were drawn from a series of over 100 objects that Healy made after interviewing people about the objects that captured their experience and recent memories of the pandemic. In our visitor center and via our web, and I'm showing here uh, Elise's keys. So this is one example from uh, that series. And, and of course our coat hooks are now functional for the first time in a very long time uh, with, with Wharton sort of brandishing the keys from that series. Uh, so, uh, so right now in our visitor center and via our website, if you go to the, the website for the exhibition, we're sharing an opportunity that allows visitors to potentially be a part of Healy's future work, um, asking the really wonderful question, if your living space were made into a museum, what object would be highlighted in the collection? Why is this object significant? And if you can draw it, uh, it gives Healy these wonderful stories that she uses to create these, these really beautiful and meaningful objects. Colin Pezzano is a woodworker and craft artist based in South Philadelphia. His practice is defined by utilizing digital and hand processes to pass along humor, pathos, and memory into his chosen materials. For the museum, Colin created these trompe l'oeil objects, which mimic tools important to his own practice. They're installed in the museum's dining room. Uh, this installation kind of exposes aspects of process normally unseen and creates a space where he and Eshrick reside simultaneously. And as every single visitor to the museum asked me today, yes, the cord for that head the headphones is indeed made of wood. Um, Colin is also, and so just a, a wonderful sort of close-up image of, of some of the objects that are indeed in the studio, including the index card, the key. And then, um, you know, Colin carves uh, blocks, wood blocks to do printing, which really connects him to Eshrick in another really magnificent way. Um, we're also showing images um, here from Colin's new graphic novel in Woodcut Soma, which we have copies of in our visitor center. Um, a wonderful connection between uh, Eshrick's life as an illustrator, his work in wood blocks. I will say that Colin probably came into this project knowing the most about Wharton Eshrick. Um, and I think you can kind of see that passion <laughs> in these images that I'm showing you here, an image of, of Wharton with the life mask 
uh, that is in our collection. And of course, Collins carving of his own and posing in a, in a way that is very much, uh, you know, an, an homage to the original image here. And last is Stacy Lee Weber. Stacy lives and works in Northeast Philadelphia. She's exhibited her jewelry, sculptures, and artwork around the world and in the collections of museums, including uh, the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery in Washington, DC. We're thrilled to have the newest work by Stacy from her Craftsman series on view at the Wharton Escher Museum. The penny chain saw here asks questions about the value and worth of handwork within Eshrick's original workspace. And just to give you a sense of the detail of uh, the piece, if you're not familiar with Stacy's work, this kind of remarkable um, attention to detail and the use of the, the sort of coins as material here. This was designed to be displayed on the flat top desk where you'll see it when you come to the studio. Stacy, when walking through, noted that what struck her first was the warmth of the copper penny sculpture and the warmth of Eshrick's wood furniture and sculpture as they interact with beams of daylight in the space. And I will say, while the image is beautiful, this is um, really a piece that that to see it with with the sort of atmosphere, um, uh, you get that warmth in in a wholly different way. I'm showing it here alongside an image of the studio interior with Essie speaking to what Eshrick's studio would have looked like before the workshop was built and it became uh, a, a space really primarily for living and display rather than working. But uh, where there once were tools, there now are tools, even if they are made from pennies. Um, works by these contemporary artists are complemented by a selection of textile objects on loan to the museum from the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia. Uh, these are produced by four artists and architects of Eshrick's era, connected in some way to his life, career, and experiences. Viola Fry, Toshiko Takeizu, Lenore Tani, and Robert Venturi are the four artists. Um, placement in Eshrick's studio really explores idea around the artist network's connections on an intimate and inviting stage, I invite you to tune in for future conversations and programs about those pieces and connections, but uh, to give a little nod to, to some of those connections I'm showing here, uh, this is a letter and a receipt that we, it was part of our large archival discoveries in the last year, where Lenar Tani uh, visited the studio. We have the receipt for what she bought. These objects are actually in the collection of the, um, the, the Kohler Museum uh, in Wisconsin, and she writes here, Dear Mr. Eshrick, you, your house, and all your work have affected me very deeply. I thank you very much, Lenore Tawney. So we have these kind of wonderful moments of connection between Eshrick and other artists that we are sort of paying homage to and, and making a new and inviting contemporary artist to engage with the space and his legacy. All right, so I am going to... Stop the share here. And I'd love to invite the artists here to unmute themselves and we can we can start having a conversation. Um, Stacy, Emily, Colin, Kay, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm curious if you can each share a little bit more about what you knew about Eshrick and the studio before the project. Um, and what about the studio or Eshrick's legacy made you excited to, to participate and to work with us? Are you directing it to anyone in particular? I, I will call on somebody, but <laughs> I'd love to hear from all of you. But if you can, if you can figure out uh, who wants to go first, that's up to you. Do you want to go first, Stacey? I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> uh, I'll go first just because I, I don't have, it's interesting that I knew a lot. I've been in Philly for 11 years. So I've, I've heard definitely about the Wharton Asherick Museum and um, but I had to con confess to not ever going until this exhibition that Emily curated and really getting a feel for the space. Um, so I like, it was like a phantom 
idea that about what it was that was so i i feel like colin has much more interesting like knowledge about it <laughs> is, this, is this my setup yes sure colin <laughs> colin what 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 did you know about the the studio before uh you were invited to do this and what made you excited to participate well um i went to university arts for craft and woodworking. Um, but I started off going to school for industrial design and just hated it. Um, and then I kind of like goofed off for the next semester and then had to declare my major in craft and material studies. I kind of followed a friend there. And my idea of woodworking was like super narrow and furniture, you know. Um, but we went on a field trip to see the Warren Eschrick Museum. And I feel like that visiting and seeing what like woodworking could be and what it was for Eshrick at least was really like um eye-opening for me and really you know made me feel that it wasn't so rigid and that there was a lot more to explore than just mm -hmm. furniture maybe or um things that are 90 degrees yeah, there's very few, very few 90 degree angles in the studio. That's for yes. sure. <laughs> hey, or Emily, um, so do I, you have? Oh, yeah, yeah, here you go. Yeah, so I also went to the University of the Arts. Um, I went for book arts and print, print making, which um, I think is why I'm so interested in narrative in a lot of my pieces. But uh, while I was there, my teacher also brought me on a field trip to the Wharton Ashrick Museum, and it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Uh, and I just remember loving the feeling of all of, like everything being touched by a human. You know, this isn't Ikea. This isn't um, what I'm used to seeing in Target or something. It's very specific and very human feeling and, um, and warm. But I also had a very closed idea of what the narrative was. Like I thought it was, this lone artist who was just working by himself. And I didn't understand the extent to which he lived on, on the site and lived down the hill from the site and had a family. Um, so then years later, I started teaching and I actually brought students, I think twice I brought students to the Wharton Eshrick Museum. So then I was leading tours or leading groups over there and um, not leading them, but bringing them to the space. And then I also was lucky enough to get lunch one time and have, I actually got to eat lunch at the table, which was a real treat just to pretend like you are Wharton Estrick. Um, and that's when I learned more about Wharton's wife and about Miriam and just that there was a, a deeper story here and it, it wasn't what I first thought the space was. And so that was actually what was really interesting to me when doing this project was kind of introducing the fact that there were these other people that were living in the space um, besides Ward and Ashrick. Emily, can we can we hear from you about, um, you know, your knowledge and your experience with the studio and, and what got you excited to, to make something for the project? So my direct experience was very little. I didn't know that I knew him. <laughs> um, he, he had my favorite piece at the PMA, so I was like, "Oh, <laughs> oh, that uh, that guy who who made the um, fireplace around in that door, that thing is amazing." <laughs> um, I would drag my husband down there to see it and gawk at it and, and nerd out about how good the wood was, and um, and then I I actually had you know I had a relationship with the Philadelphia area you know since I was in high school and. I had no idea that the museum was there, had no idea that he lived his life there, and um, was very pleased to like be able to learn more and to deep it, to dive deep into this project. So, mm. so I'm curious for, for all of you, if this was the first time that you had produced work for a historic site, or um, is this something that is regularly a part of your practice? Um, uh, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, I was going to say no, actually. Um, this is not the first time. Actually, mm -hmm. Heather Bunkeri, who is here. Hi, Heather. Um, 
she produced a, a show with me and, and Colin in 2020 um, in a storefront on Fourth Street dealing on Fabric Pro. And that was that I think that was actually the first one. And it's nice because my work is so it tends to be so rooted in historical research and that sort of thing. It's really nice to be able to actually engage historic space with that work. Mm. And so what what do you think are some of the kind of challenges and opportunities of working in historic space? You gotta be careful about fasteners. <laughs> <laughs> Real it's a very practical challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that's what my brain goes versus like, just be careful of what you stick a hole in. Um, and then, you know, I think besides, it, honestly, that's probably the biggest challenge that I think of for real. Like, mm. um, because the space itself, you have to be, you know, mindful of the historic preservation. You know, you don't want to interrupt that at all. Mm. And those sorts of limitations can re really change the way that you put a piece together. I mean, the nice thing about um, the studio is that like, you know, immediately going up to, upstairs to the bedroom, I was like, oh, great, there's a bed. <laughs> <laughs> right, I make, I make textiles, I make quilts, there is a bed, we can, yeah. we've got something to work with here. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else want to speak to, to their experience working in historic spaces? Yeah, I should. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Have Colin go and then Stacy and then Kay. Okay. Um, so yeah, me and Emily work with past present projects on uh, Fabric Grow and 4th Street. And I think what was really exciting about that and same with the Eshik Museum is that there's, there's so much more, uh, well, there is, there's context to the work in the space opposed to like the white walls where you can literally put anything in there. You have to be really thoughtful about how you're responding to the space and what significance it has. Um, you know, luckily the two spaces I've done, the Fabric Row installation was directly linked to my family, my grandfather growing up on 4th Street, my grandmother growing up on 5th Street, my whole family coming from Italy to uh, Philadelphia, and then the Warren Eshrick, you know, kind of like my introduction into what woodworking could be. So I think they're both pretty loaded uh, spaces to get to work in. So what, was there anything challenging about that, the, the sort of legacy or that, that narrative as you were thinking about uh, how you were going to engage with, with this particular historic space? Oh yeah, terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but in a good way, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy that I'm able to be part of a studio and a museum that uh, means so much to me. Hmm. Stacy, what about, what about you? Yeah, I, I think in general, just it's rare, um, but it does like the experience reminded me of the Mercer Museum um, in Doylestown. And there was an exhibition that um, Cappy Kennard put together. And it was it was a lot of artists, maybe 20 artists that kind of looked at the collection and and were asked to be inspired or respond. Um, and I don't know if you guys have ever been to that museum, but it's amazing and it's a it's tools, but it's also just like the kitchen is a tool. So it's a whole area of like kitchen tools. So it's not just heart, uh, what we think of as a hammer and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I guess overall, it's kind of interesting because usually museums are very like curated and don't touch. And so having a chance to respond like, where they let you go in and like touch the thing or, you know, um, kind of carefully place your piece in there is, is like exciting and brings the objects into maybe more like every day, kind of thinking about when that person or that museum like had those things around and weren't such like a museum, you know, precious PMA setting or something like that. Um, yeah, and I think with 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 you, Stacey, I know that finding out that the the studio had been a workspace was was really exciting and yeah, I you. love that. Um, the whole space is amazing, but yeah, I felt like definitely a kindred spirit to like the workspace and just someone like just toiling away on, um, you know, what they're making for all hours of the night. Um, definitely, just can relate to that. So it felt like just fun to kind of bring it back to you making a piece, me making a piece for 
the space that he was making all of his pieces in. So there's some like, I don't know, mojo energy like happening there. Um, but yeah, super fun. Like, I don't know. I just think it's cool to put yourself in someone else's shoes or kind of try that, get your mind into that history. Mm. Okay, what about you? I know, you, I mean, you're engaging with other people's stories all the time, <laughs> but it's it's got to be a little different to do it within the context of, of a sort of historic space or, or an artist space um, versus people's stories about sort of more uh, everyday objects. Uh, definitely, yeah. I, uh, I get a lot of inspiration from other people, but in this case, it's already a furnished space. So like Colin was saying, there's so much context and it was really fun just walking around and being able to you know, open, it was the utensil drawer that really inspired me to sort of nest in Wharton Eshrick's space. And so it's this really cool utensil drawer that comes out on an angle and it's beautiful. And then inside are his forks and knives or I, I think they're his, I don't know if he just put them there, but um, I had made a fork and knife set, set that has this whole story behind it that um, I thought, oh, I can put those inside of there. And I was really interested and what I found the most challenging was just that it wasn't a white wall to work on. So I didn't want to do, like I have some huge pieces, like I could do big panels or whatever. And I, I just thought that would be very intrusive. And so that's why I called it the soft touch because I wanted it to be sort of like things that you discover that are more embedded. And um, it's really nice to see the other artists work because I think everybody did that. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's just, it's very integrated. It's nobody was like, here's my huge canvas that I'm gonna stick in the middle of <laughs> the living room or whatever. Um, it all feels very, um, I don't know, sort of respectful of how much is already going on there and sort of in conversation with things instead of being, um, you know, sort of like uh, an ego thing. Mm. So, so that's what I was, I was really considering was just like, how can I put things in but not overwhelm the space because there's already so much happening on the site. And um, I'm also thinking about viewers just being kind of overwhelmed with having, seeing the space for the first time, learning about where it for the first time. And then, oh yeah, now there's four artists that are also putting their work in, but it's just a lot going on, but it was really um, exciting and fun to think about it in a new way. And especially having worked at museums, actually in college, I worked at a historic museum. I think it's really exciting to, to have contemporary things going on in a space that could sort of be like a snapshot of time, you know, be very static to invite artists in to sort of rethink things. I think it, um, it energizes the space. And so it's really cool that you guys are doing it. Well, so, so I'm gonna ask everyone this, but Kay, while, while you're sort of already kind of talking a little bit about the topic, um, you know, I'm curious if, if you can can share a little bit more about the specific objects and, and how you see the objects that you chose or for the other artists, the objects that you made um, uh, sort of being in conversation with the space itself. So um, most of the objects I had already created and so it was more just finding things that would fit within his space. So um, it's over 30 objects, they're all pretty small, so you know, they're, it's not uh, too crazy, but uh, the ones that I made were the toothbrushes that you mentioned before. And that's just from my own experience of relationships um, and intimacy is that once the toothbrush comes over, you know, there's two of them in your space that sort of signifies uh, that how many people are living in the space. <laughs> so I wanted to definitely create that. And so I went and found images of 1960s toothbrushes, which are incredibly expensive. If you want to buy them on eBay, they're like a hundred dollars <laughs> and disgusting <laughs> looking. Um, and I texted with my mom, like, is this what your toothbrushes look like? <laughs> and she helped me out a little bit. And then I recreated them based off of that imagery. Um, but I also added in a lot of objects from pandemic stories. So when you come in, you see a mask you know, hanging from the door. I don't know if you guys still have that, but that was not something I had a 
three years ago. <laughs> when you first come in, came into my house, you didn't have, you know, a pile of masks that um, were just ready to go in case they needed to go to the grocery store. Um, and then, yeah, there's a number of other pieces. My father-in-law, right before the pandemic, he um, was diagnosed with dementia. And so we're actually caretakers for him now. And so I put a number of his pieces in as well. He was also um, a woodworker. He built a lot of his own furniture. And so it was really nice to be able to show him like, oh, look, I put your, this is your pill case that I recreated. And this is your Celeste pizza that's in the fridge. And this is your Pepsi. And it's in this really cool space that um, I'm hoping to bring him to at some point. Mm, so it's not just a, you know, a conversation between your creative practice, but also all of these other people that you sort of channel in your work with the space as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we also talked, um, Emily, a lot about sort of the um, bringing some feminine stories into the space. So um, when you open the fridge, there's also breast pumps inside of there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there is a pregnancy test in the medicine cabinet. So just sort of bringing in, um, I guess it's what the conversation that hasn't happened before uh, mm. into the space. I, I think that was a through line with a, with a couple of other artists sort of thinking about the lives of um, not only other people who sort of passed through the space, but also who collaborated and, and connected with Ashrick And Emily, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about your piece and the kind of relational aspects of it that, that were intriguing to you as you were thinking about um, uh, putting something together. Yeah, um, initially I had been thinking, I was, I was really interested in using and thinking about like the wood and the, um, the dye properties that are available in the woods that he was that Ashok was using, but you know the more that Emily, you and I were talking, and you were kind of filling me in on what was going on around there, and like the people that were coming through, and um, Kay, like you were talking about, like the the women that were in his life, um, I became further interested in kind of how to express those relationships um, with one another. So initially I was like gonna focus on his relationship with Ed Ray and, you know, just sort of the um, the ways in which as creators sometimes our, um, the folks that we get source materials from become parts of our creative process. And, and I'll certain... say Ed Ray here, who is was Eshrick's wood supplier. Um, and yeah. worked collaboratively with him. Yeah, for folks who who are un unfamiliar with Ed Ray, I know Emily, that story really intrigued you. Yeah, I just, I thought that was so interesting. And part of the reason I thought that was interesting too is because I was in, in having been transitioning to Vermont to start this retreat space and, you know, looking at a bunch of woods and trying to figure out what to do with them. So I thought that was like, and, and starting to work with a logger. And I was like, oh, what an interesting relationship. But then also thinking about, you know, and even drawing from like my own relationship and being in relationship with another creator and the intimate conversations that you have when you're just like in the kitchen and or just like passively doing something. Um, I got very intrigued by, by all of those threads. So I wanted to bring in the story of Letty and you know, I got, you know, sort of intrigued by what her journey was and where she ended up and how the whole biography really in the woodworking didn't really start until her interest in textiles came through. And, um, you know, her interest in, in studying led them to a, a place where he started playing with wood. And, and so just the, the intimacy of creative relationships just became so much more interesting to me. So in looking at the, the work that I created, it kind of starts out with very heavy on um, wood-based dyes and moves into these more vibrant colors that were taken from, uh, and the colors were inspired from work that Letty had made, um, some of her embroidery work. Thanks, Emily. Colin, Colin and Stacy, can, can you guys talk a little bit more about how um, you see the sort of themes and ideas of, of the work that you've made being in conversation with, with the space that, that you've placed it in? I don't know um, who wants to go first. <laughs> I'll go go first. ahead, Colin. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I kind of view it as um, 
luckily, I, I feel like my artist statement has kind of shifted into this mode of what I'm really focusing on is, you know, telling my own personal narrative or things that I've experienced or my perspectives through woodworking and thinking about all the other people that have done that for me and how they contribute to this larger conversation that is craft, that is woodworking. Um, so I wanted the, the space to be about that and, you know, that me and uh, Eshrick are sitting in the same space and making work, you know, and, and continuing this conversation through like time, basically. Um, and it was pretty interesting to take the time to think about um, what were the objects to choose and which ones were like important to communicate. You know, obviously I'm not gonna put a bandsaw in the middle of the kitchen, um, but you know, being in the space made me think about in my own house, how I'm spreading out to every corner as much to like the uh, begrudgment of my roommates that I'm like working at the coffee table while I'm watching like TV or, you know, I'm, I'm like whittling on the porch or something like that. So I wanted to bring that idea to like the kitchen uh, dining area. And yeah, I, I feel like that was what I was trying to go for. And some of the objects are a little more direct, like my uh, combination square or um, the, uh, like the knife or the gouge or the sketchbook. But then there's things like the, um, the index card, which I think of as like repetition, or um, I think we talked about it, Emily. Gary Panter is an artist mm -hmm. I really like. And on his Instagram lately, he's just been writing on index cards and taking photos of them as like vehicles of communication, as like the photo in his Instagram posts. And I really like that idea. And then things like the, the headphones that are, you know, while I'm working a lot of time listening to music or listening to a podcast that then becomes part of the work also. And like you create associations with the thing that you're listening to and the thing that you're working on. So it has this kind of connection there that I'm interested in. Um, and then also the, um, the fortune teller mm -hmm. is something that I had made before, um, but I think of that as kind of a metaphor of uh, like magical thinking where almost similar to like a talking board, you know, like a Ouija board kind of thing or like a magic eight ball that you're using this outside thing to communicate with someone or something from like a different space, I guess <laughs> that's kind of. Well, and you're doing that across, across, across time through material, right? Even, even, even um, if, even if the fortune teller wasn't a part of the installation. So yeah. Stacy, what about you? Um, yeah, just, I think that the series I am working in and similar as I was looking up the other artists, um, and what they're showing is like lent them lent itself, like the work to kind of talking about the space already. So I'm like heavily invested in this series of tools. Um, and of course this is a, a woodworker. Um, and the tools themselves being pennies and copper, sort of, I already talk about them like ghosts, like people will look at them, a lot of the tools and like think it's an actual tool or, you know, not a sculpture or like, can I use it or that kind of thing. Um, and I see like Kay's work has that too. And um, I think just, so this series already was lending itself to kind of being these representations of objects that have existed there. But the chainsaw in particular, I felt like was kind of poignant. I was like in progress on this piece and Emily, I think in the show coming gave me this great motivation to like finish this big piece for the show, just to be such a cool unveiling at the Wharton Eshrick Museum. Um, but also thinking about the object, just that it's so aggressive and to me, it, it is like a masculine time of woodworkers and there's those like knobs of each person's face. And I think they were all men, right? Pretty sure. But, <laughs> <laughs> but just to like bring this like aggressive tool from me, a girl that um, is in this like a masculine space was kind of interesting. And then also the correlation of 
the studio in the woods, right? Like when I came, there was people like hanging from, from trees, like doing all this, um, construction. I think there were like yeah, a bunch St of limbs down. Stacy, Stacy came on a day when there was tree work going on, on the campus. And so, uh, we were, we were filled with, with people who were coming and, and sort of taking down, um, uh, trees. And then, then I, and then we spent some time in the workshop too, looking at Eshrick's bandsaw, which is a part of the museum's right. collection. And so thinking about, um, that historic tool and the contemporary tools that were being used to, to sort of, uh, uh, manage the trees on the property. Right. So it just, it just like kept feeling really fitting with the space. And instead of, you know, making a smaller tool or something, I was just like, I'm going to finish this piece for this table and it's amazing. And yeah, there's so many connections. I, I think just being an artist in the studio full time with other assistants helping and um, like you guys are all talking about the relationships with people. And that's definitely what I felt, too, is just thinking about all the people that were there at one time or being very related to like how I'm working. And I live in my studio and have a gallery space and have like a wood shop and just one of those spaces where you're just like, I'm just always here making stuff or working on it's a lifestyle like I think someone Emily said if you want a beautiful life you have to create it and I think that that's so poignant because I believe in that fullheartedly and it seems like Wharton Eshrick does too. Yeah, I think I think your 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 workspace, which is in um, Globe Dye Works, for for folks who haven't had a chance to to visit Stacy, this integration of your uh, living space with your working space with uh, other people who come there's a there's there's definitely parallels to that kind of holistic creation of um, a life and work as a part of the same bigger artistic project and that certainly you know was a part of the conversation I think with with everyone um, you know what it means to to be in a space where uh, there's individual artworks yes but like the actual artistic project is the space itself and how you have that conversation um, as an artist with with a space that is in itself a sort of artistic uh, statement. Um, I just kind of yeah please <laughs> I don't yeah. know if y'all felt this but I think some of the the itch for me like I I also ran a, a similar type space in in Philly called the art department for um, eight years and it was a you know live work exhibit perform type space and i a lot of the urge to start that space with, with me and my co-founder was coming out of having collective education and then having to go off and like work solo in your studio by yourself or having that be the expectation and then trying to like recreate what community looks like because you you know create so differently when you have all of that energy moving around you yeah, I think totally. I think community is a is a really lovely note to sort of open it up for some some bigger questions, both because mm -hmm. I, I think, um, you know, this is a project like this where we bring contemporary artists into the space is about highlighting Eshrick as a sort of linchpin of a community, whether it's a community of visitors to the site or a community of artists who still engage with his voice and legacy um, uh, after the fact, but also you know, we've got a community of folks here tonight too, and I'd love to to um, ask anyone who has a question for for these artists to either unmute themselves or put it in the chat, and we've got a little time for conversation. And if we are feeling shy, I will ask another, I'll, I'll ask a question here. Um, you know, I'd love to know for, for each of you, what's next? What are you working on? What, um, what's exciting in your practice now? Um, yeah. I can't, I could go. Do you want to start? Stacey, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, Oh my gosh, I was going to say I can go and then I'm like, don't have anything. But I, <laughs> I mean, there's so much going on like all at once. Um, 
but I'm excited about, I'm working on this big chain link fence made out of pennies. Um, that'll be more like an installation piece. So kind of breaking through to more, less like object object and more of an installation. Um, I'm excited that we just really have like a great group of assistants right now and everyone just is really like clicking and that whole community and what if it's really working it's like so exciting like you're all just having fun. Um, so I'm really excited just about that about the energy of the studio and we have a gallery too. Uh, Bertram Productions is our gallery so like the other artists are doing well right now and there's upcoming shows so. And we'll make, sure, we'll make sure to we'll make sure to link people to to what you guys are doing now in the follow up email yeah, that's after the great. program. Oh, Please. and we do have a question from the audience. The interactions that the artists had with the loan objects from the fabric museum, they didn't really. So those were all historic pieces. They weren't contemporary pieces. And so um, uh, those are integrated into the site. Um, but, you know, I really, we worked, the artists worked individually with, with me to, to sort of decide where they wanted to be and in the space that they wanted to be. We have one other question here from Helen. Um, as an artist, did you ever feel overwhelmed by being in another's creative space? And how did you maintain your individuality? That's a big question. Hmm. Does anyone want to take that on? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have a tendency to, I love being in, in other folks' creative space. I love the conversations that can happen. And um, especially now being in textiles and, and dying, I mean, it's just the whole world has blown wide open for me. So I get really excited by like, I mean, being like on a conversation with a bunch of woodworkers and metal workers gets me so pumped because I'm just like, <laughs> there's, so, there's so many ways that you can kind of collaborate and use those things um, in a textile practice. So as far as like maintaining individuality, um, you know, I will say I do my I do my research. I kind of like I like to check in with myself. I like to be aware of what I'm attracted to, and try to figure out you know why that is. Um, and also, when it comes to to um, you know subjects that I'm interested in, I really I kind of like to, I like to let that carry me, and then dip into collaboration when that feels um, feels appropriate, especially when I there are things that I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> mm, so we've got in, individuality is not always all it's cracked up to be when it when when the when the collaborative stuff uh, brings you somewhere new and exciting and different. Yeah, yeah, I think there's something about, um, you know, being able to take uh, disparate ideas and create a, a sort of singular individual idea you know that way yeah you've got something new that's greater than the sum of its parts yeah does anyone else want to take a crack at that or share what they're working on now that's really exciting to them um i think it's really exciting to see other people's studios especially in philadelphia i feel like it's always like very scrappy i'm always excited when people are uh tell me about their basement studio and i'm like i have a basement studio too and it's gross <laughs> and it's awesome you know <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy about it. Everyone kind of makes it work, you know, and just uh, is figuring it out as they go and maybe don't have all the tools they need right away, but are like slowly getting there. And I don't ever feel, um, I don't, I don't feel like inadequate. I'm just excited and motivated by other people being active and making things always. I don't feel like it's a competition because we're all doing our own thing and, you know, you're the best at what you do, so. We're all just individuals in a goat herd. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a goat. <laughs> Kay, do you have any, any thoughts on this? Um, I've often found that even if I tried to copy someone else, it would still end up looking like my own thing, so. Um, the more I try to render something, it's still gonna, because it's on fabric and it's coming from my hand, it's just gonna look weird and lumpy and um, do what it wants to do. So 
luckily I, I don't worry too much about uh, it looking, you know, unique or original. Um, so now that that hasn't come up for me, uh, I did, like I said before, I didn't want to overwhelm the space. Like I, I do feel a lot of respect for another artist studio space. And so uh, that, that definitely came into play. And it, it seemed like it did with everyone just based off of what people came up with for their, um, their, their work that they had on um, for the show. And uh, in terms of what I'm working on now, I'm really excited about, I've been making um, this big panel that's gonna be in a show in England uh, this winter that is uh, in my bathroom after I've given my toddler a bath. So it's a, a total nightmare. Just like, it looks like a tornado <laughs> swept through. And it's been really interesting recreating the objects that she uh, threw everywhere. And just noticing, like, first of all, spending so much time rendering, like drawing, screen printing, stuffing, painting, and recreating them. Um, you know, this thing that took her 30 seconds to destroy. And then also just thinking about the individual objects and how vital they are to me right now, like the wipes. Like if you don't have the wipes, you're in a lot of trouble right now. <laughs> so things that I didn't care about several years ago or didn't even know it existed, like a snack cup that has these, this weird like, top to it so that she can only pull out a few Cheerios at a time instead of thousands on the floor all at once. Um, so yeah, I've been sort of focusing on these these objects that are now very valuable to me but uh weren't before and apparently won't be in a few years no this is this is what i was telling telling Kay that <laughs> in a few years <laughs> you will not think about these at all which is great it's it's a cyclical um yeah. which actually kind of leads us what to to what i'm gonna have be our our last question from heather here about the humor um among the group and and the role that humor plays i think that um you know for estrick right uh, we've got a person whose motto was, if it's if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. And humor is a big part of his own outlook and way of looking at the world. And, and I'd love to hear um, anyone's sort of feelings on how humor might play into to what they're doing. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah, I'll just like not take yourself too seriously is kind of a motto I usually have just in my head I don't say that but uh, <laughs> I don't know I just there's just so much fun like maybe making fun of like your own self I do that all the time because I just think it's lighthearted and and people I don't know just it's just fun more fun to be around like a little bit where it's not so like serious art art um, and it might come off that way in other settings but I think in the studio it's pretty fun like pretty yeah I don't know <laughs> yeah I have to say too like I I humor is really critical um when I think about like the endurance of being in the studio and I can't get through without like comedy podcasts or just like somebody coming in to make me laugh or, or I don't know, making myself laugh. Like I, 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 I make myself laugh all the time. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> totally foolish. And um, yeah, yeah, that and good music. I think like humor is absolutely critical to the work. I can speak to that too. Emily is very, very funny. Oh, thank you. I had a show at, at the art department and it was a lot of laughs. It was really fun. Um, <laughs> but I think especially when you're kind of dealing with topics that are sometimes really hard. So a lot of my stories that are behind the objects, like the pandemic stories or objects people lost that they wish they still had, or I know Emily does a lot of really amazing, intense work as well. Having the humor just allows people to come in and it's much more accessible than, than uh, you know, just having a huge artist statement about what all of this means. And um, so I think it's an entryway. So by things looking soft or warm or inviting or humorous, or kind of you know strange looking it, it sort of invites people in 
so that they can um, be more open, I think, to maybe some of the harder things that are behind the, the pieces as well. Hmm. Well, I think I think all of the artists in in this exhibition do a really wonderful job of sort of meeting people where they are with with their work, um, figuring out ways to invite them in, figuring out ways to engage with um, with you know visitors, but also with Eshrick's story, meeting Eshrick where he is, um, and so I really hope people will come and see these installations. I think the question of individuality is, is an interesting one because um, this is also temporary, right? Come, <laughs> come March, we'll open for our wow. 2023 season and the studio will be back to the way it was. So we've got this chance to have this, this sort of conversation across time before we go back to Eshrick, the individual. And I really hope that people will make a special trip to come out and see this work um, or stay tuned for additional conversations and programming about these, these artists and, and their really wonderful pieces. It was such a joy and a pleasure and great fun to work with all of them. Um, and I wanna thank them here tonight for giving their time and their energy and their attention to this. And we're thrilled to have you as a part of uh, the Wharton Eshrick Museum family. We'll say it. <laughs> Thank you very much to, to, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. For everyone else, we'll yeah. hope, we hope that we'll see you at future programs and we'll provide you with links in a follow-up to the event so you can check out and spend time with all of these artists' work um, on your own. I encourage you to do so. And we hope to see you at future Wharton Eshrick Museum programs and events we often uh, unmute and just say a goodbye as we're leaving. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful evening and a great weekend coming up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Emily. Bye. Nice Thank you. So